Today is May 22nd, and we have a very special guest on the program. It's Meredith Marakovitz. Let's talk some Yanks. Steaming hot takes. Your Yankees news with these two fine dudes. It's time for Talking Yanks. Talking Yanks with old John Boy. John Boy and Jake. Talking Yanks with old John Boy. John Boy and Jake. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Talking Yanks. My name is Jimmy, and I have Jake. We are both in New York City in our apartments. Secluded, quarantine, riding this out. BBD is in the little corner, and we're very excited about the conversation that we just wrapped up with Meredith Morakovitz, the sideline reporter for Yes Network, host of a lot of shows. Uh, we sat down with Meredith for the first time in winter meetings, and she was on the show then. So we did a little uh, another time, and you know, it's, it's good, free flowing, fun conversation, Jake, right? Yeah, uh, Meredith's the best, man. We, uh, it's, I mean, exactly, exactly what we want. I mean, she, she, she was just talking. She's one of us. She's quarantining just like everyone and going through the ups and downs of quarantine. And we've got a, a little bit of silly, <laughs> silly start to the introduction. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, that's kind of what makes this forum great. Cause, uh, yeah, I mean, good stuff, man. I, you know, we got got some really good labor stories in there, uh, some good quarantine stuff. So it's uh, it was it was fun to do. I'm assuming it's a good listen. That's how I that's how I think about it. If we enjoy the conversation, we hope people enjoy listening to it. I mean, kudos to Mare because Mare, like I know her, Dith is what she put. She put her name in yeah. as Dith, which is really funny to me because in college, maybe I'll tell you the story. Jake knows. Yeah. In college, yeah. one of our roommates dated a girl named Meredith, and just to be annoying as all hell, we just started using the word "dith" in replace. Like wherever you could put the word "dith," we were just like, "Put the word dith. And he didn't. I don't know if he liked. Made dith the word. Yeah, we were like, I can't even think of an example right now. Like, didn't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> like we're yeah. just nonstop to have his girlfriend was named Dith. So I I got a when she put her name as Dith, I was like, oh my God, flashback. Wow. Yeah. Um in the same boat. Okay. Well hadn't seen a uh, Dith in a while. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Yeah. Uh here is our conversation with Meredith. What button do I hit? Back to back. <laughs> belly to belly. We are joined by Yankee sideline reporter, Instagram show host of We're Here. Is that what we're calling it? Live with Mare, her own show. Uh, I don't know, daughter of Disco and Kath. What what else am I missing for the introduction for Meredith Marakovitz? Freezer repair Water. woman. Freezer repair woman, washed up Division One athlete. Um, okay. Six to two brothers. What else can I go with? I don't know. <laughs> Keep, best, you best keep friend, going. Let's see what else friend, we got. Best friend of Susan. Best friend of Susan. Fake niece to to two uh, of my friends, or I should say, one of my friends' uh, three kids. Uh, fake aunt to. Hold on, did I get that? <laughs> yeah, right? no. I was gonna say <laughs> fake niece. All right. Imaginary nieces. They're not imaginary, but they're not blood related. So are they really my nieces? I don't know. You may be a fake niece too. Did you grow up calling anyone auntie? An aunt that wasn't a. Just the two were that were legitimate. Okay. One on yeah. Dick's side, one on my mom's side. So okay, yeah, no imaginary things there. All right, that so was... that's so now you can, everyone knows who we're chatting with. Yeah. <laughs> like I can't get that thirty seconds back. Oh, you're good. How you, how you doing, Meredith? We we just checked in with you, but you're you're still in Florida and you're you're doing stuff. I mean, you were you're doing some Yes Network stuff. You're doing the live show. I. Didn't like the John Boy episode, but I'll move on from that. But <laughs> but what's going on with you? We have to get you on for one. I've actually cut back with the live with Mayor shows just because I have been doing other stuff for Yes Network and random stuff as well. Uh, but that was kind of something that I started 
when this whole quarantine stay at home thing started just out of boredom. And I thought it was a good way to interact with fans, keep people engaged. I know everybody, uh, including the three of us, are, we're all missing baseball right now. So it was fun. John Boy did a great job. Awesome show. Jake, we'll have to get you on. Is it no, John, I, that John Boy was on first? No, no, no. I mean, I for me, you're going to gain some new fans, but you're going to lose a lot of old fans. So I get it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and it's it's kind of funny. I feel like everyone who's doing content stuff, like you started off and it was kind of this, I don't want to say fun part of the quarantine, but it was like, all right, like I'll do Instagram live. I'll, I'll do all this stuff. And now we've kind of hit a point where it's like, all right, that was fun, but let's <laughs> some baseball would be fantastic. That would be ideal. And I feel like everyone is doing it now. There's a live every 30 seconds. So the novelty, I think, has worn off. Uh, and there's just so much out there. So we're trying to figure out new ways. We still haven't done a new thing with Susan. So I'm working on that. I'm not exactly sure what we are going to do yet, but I have been checking in with Susan a lot. And as far as the Yes Network is concerned, I spoke to Marcus Timms today for Yes, We're Here. He's down in Tampa. He's going to the facility three times a week. And tomorrow I'm expected to chat with James Paxton. So hopefully nice. we will have some updates for you guys regarding those two. I'm, yeah, that is awesome. I mean, you already had Tino and Paulie on, and it's kind of the same thing. Like, like Jake said at the, at the beginning, and everyone's like, "All right, let's get creative." You know, we're we're in this to do fun stuff, and then it's like, okay, it's so much easier when baseball just gives us storylines and we can just talk about them every night. Um, I wanted. Oh shit, I had something I forget. This is <laughs> this is how bad I am right now. Jake and I have. <laughs> damn it. Whatever. I forget. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so upset. Now's not the time. Well, another thing I want to ask about is when they Polly and Coney and Michael get tapped in to do play by play on a video game. Yes. First, what do you think their actual reactions were? Because I got to <laughs> think that Coney and Polly were like, what the hell do you want me to do? I would say highlight or low light for all of their careers. I don't know. <laughs> Here's what I'll say about everybody that's working at Yes. Everybody understands what's going on right now. It's just not normal. We, we can't do the same things that we typically do. So we've had to pivot. We've had to try new things. And everybody has been down to try those new things. So I'll give those guys a lot of credit. I mean, you're talking about David Cohn who threw a perfect game and now he's doing commentary for a video game. I don't think that's the way he would have drawn it up, but he's a team player and he realizes people are missing baseball and he's willing to do whatever he can to try to keep fans connected and to keep Yankees fans connected to the Yes Network. So I give those two guys a lot of credit because we've asked them to do, not me personally, I, I didn't really ask them anything, um, but our company has asked them to, to do some things. And Michael's always busy Monday through Friday with his radio show, but he's asked to do additional things for whether, you know, it's going on, yes, the actual network or our YouTube channel or whatever outlet it is going to be distributed in. He's been doing some stuff too. So um, my favorite thing with Polly is I caught up with him for a yes, we're here. And I had him do a little scavenger hunt type of thing okay. around the house, which was kind of fun. And I asked him if he had this one particular kind of wine and he trumped me with a bottle that's even better than the one I asked him about. And I said, like, oh. of course, he has a whole thing of wine behind him. Polly. Like, I'm jealous, Polly, I'm jealous. I was tuning in uh, and Ooh. catching up. And you also, Polly, asked him what errands his wife was making him run around the house. And it was funny, Jake, he goes, well, she, I had to clean the shower. I broke it. <laughs> Which is just <laughs> fits perfectly into like who we like want the character of Paul O'Neill to be. <laughs> yeah. And that's, he revealed Jake that he's a grill master now too. Oh he's yeah. So he's super excited about that because oh, I don't know that something that there. he typically did. Cause he's having, like, having a blast on the grill. <laughs> <laughs> Kids are over, we're, we're grilling, we're grilling. So he's such a lovable character and he's been so sweet to me through my entire tenure so far at Yes, I've been there since 2012 uh, and he's treated me really well. But he is so funny sometimes and I don't even think he realizes he's being funny. No. I, yeah. Oh, no. He, he has no idea. Um, and that's, uh, I, I kind of want to segue that into the, 
who who do you think's losing their mind the most? Because we have baseball people are wired differently. It's it's that it's at least in the backdrop of your summer, even when you're having you know your boat days or whatever you're doing, you check in on the game or you you know you throw it on after all that. I mean, you know, uh, even Susan Waldman, Kester, uh, ev- all all the players you mentioned. I mean, these are people <laughs> that occupy their summers with baseball. Is it has anyone been like? Hey, we gotta we gotta check on Kester because I don't know what he's doing. I think everyone. I think we're all <laughs> checking on each other because I think one thing we can agree: those that are involved with baseball, it's such a grind. But it's a grind that you enjoy in a weird sort of way, unless you go through it year in and year out. You really don't understand it, and you don't understand the almost addiction to it. Uh, so to not have anything to do is just odd this time of year. And speaking to Susan, she, this is the first time she's been home since I don't even know when during the spring to be able to see her flowers come up and to be able to play with the dogs and all that good stuff. But I think everybody has their good days and their bad days, and that's not exclusive to baseball people, whether it be those that cover it, uh, those that are playing it, those in, in vo- involved in the sport in any way. I just think everyone is having uh, you know, great days, bad days. It's just a weird time that we're all kind of trying to adjust to. So I hope everybody is calling, texting, FaceTiming their loved ones and friends and checking in and saying, hey, just want to make sure you're good. I, uh, sure I got to think John Sterling. I mean, 30 years straight, pretty <laughs> regimented lifestyle. Uh, and I think they should have John do the the video game call. Oh, man. Uh, well, Get- there are several factors uh, that would that would <laughs> probably be a problem with that. Number one, explain what a video game is. <laughs> he doesn't have a computer and he doesn't have a smartphone. Yeah. He has an old flip phone. So I don't know how you go about doing that when you don't have any way to watch it. He certainly no. doesn't have a yeah. gaming system. <laughs> so Imagine if, if a- they sent like an intern, like a 16 year old, 18 year old kid to go set up a video game for John Sterling. I mean, but can you even like let somebody in his house? I don't yeah. think that's a good thing um, to do not knowing where they've been. So you'd need to quarantine somebody for 15 days and then allow them to drive to John Sterling's house, <laughs> set it up and then leave. But they'd likely have to stay for a lot of it just to make sure that John knew what he was doing. But if you set it up for him, I bet he would do it. He might I forget he it's a video it. game. He might just, you know, get really into it. He'll just be happy to be calling baseball again. And it's funny, we had a little uh, Zoom call that we did with the beat. Just everybody kind of checking up on each other, seeing how everybody's getting through it. It was about two maybe three weeks into this whole thing. And we were trying to get John on because John had called me the day before just to check to see how I was doing, which I thought was adorable. And yeah, that's great. really, made my day. it made my day. <laughs> um, so we were trying to get him to call in, but for whatever reason, it didn't work out. I think I didn't have the upgraded version, which would provide you with the phone number. It was only through email or the app on your phone, which he doesn't get apps on the phone. So it was a bummer that we couldn't get him to join, but actually he is on my list of people to call and check on. Next time you can ask our producer, David down here, BBD, because we had to do that with Lance Lynn, who has a flip phone, no smartphone and lives out on a farm in Southern Illinois. Yes. (laughs) It's pretty, pretty fun. Uh, did, were you upset that they didn't tap you in to do some sideline reporting for the virtual game? I think that would be hilarious. What would I even say? I mean, <laughs> make stuff up, right? Yeah, yeah. Stuff up as you <laughs> Figure go. Figure it out. They just say, Why like, not? Oh, let's go to Marathon. They just, you pop on the screen <laughs> and just make something up. Yeah. That'd be fun. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, well, you know, I've, I'm really well-versed in injury reports, so I could just make up some bizarro injury and continue to update that throughout the game, right? That'd be pretty uh, funny. No, I mean, yeah. Not, I'm not upset. I would have done it. I don't know how it would have all worked, but I think three voices were probably enough for that particular show. It was pretty good. But I'll tell I you tuned, this. I tuned have, in. I liked it. It was funny. Did you? Yeah. I watched a little bit of it. I'll confess. Oh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't watch, watch the whole thing. I watched like, <laughs> an, when I say I tuned, I watched like an inning. I was like, that's awesome. I can't believe they're actually doing this. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> a couple people listening to this did listen to the whole thing and know that, uh, uh, kudos to you, but you're also like, take 
<laughs> Take a step back. Well, I was going to ask, would you think of me differently if I said that I watched the entire thing and then watched it over again just to make sure that they didn't make any mistakes? If you, yes. sent, if you sent notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like just, just straight up, yes. Unless unless you were doing it to make fun of Kay or something like that. But yeah, if you did that. Ah. Oh, but I, the, I, the, inning, the inning I tuned in, I, and again, credit where credit's due and we're all figuring stuff out, but it, there's like a ground ball up the middle and Kester was full in on it. I couldn't believe it. He goes, ground ball to Torres, fires to first, got him. And I was like, oh my God. We are in the bizarro world. It's happened. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, these guys just miss it so much, as we all do, that any opportunity to have any normalcy and do what you're used to doing, I I think is welcomed. We I tuned in for the inning and there was a fly ball like and the camera showed that it was gonna be a home run, but Kay didn't get tricked. I was so happy for him. Because you know, (laughs) if he started doing the home run call and then it was caught at the wall and and they were trying. And I I think I like messaged, I was like, Good job, Kay. Like, good job. I know you don't want to get you know, keep your head up. What's right. um have have we fallen into any new quarantine hobbies? I know we just had uh, Lindsay Adler on, and she's uh, she's lost in the world of different kind of bread baking. Um, I, I mean, it's comical to some of the details she's she's gotten into. I know you mentioned you're binging the shows. You said you're keeping keeping the place tidy, which John Boy made a joke at my expense. Is there a new hobby or or what are we getting lost in? I wouldn't say it's a new hobby. It's just something that I don't get to do very often because of my lifestyle. So I have cooked every meal essentially with the exception of one since March 11th. Damn. So a lot of cooking, a lot of cooking. What's the, what's the rinse and repeat? Like what's like, okay, once a week, I at least cook this meal over and over again. I try to mix it up a little bit, but I'm kind of a a weird eater. I eat basically pescatarian, but I've been incorporating some animal protein just because I'm bored and I need new things. So twice now I've roasted mini chickens. Okay. And then it's like a game. What can I make from the mini chicken? So like one day I'll eat the chicken with the vegetables that I had in the little Dutch oven that I roasted it in. And then the next day I'm like, oh, what can I use the rest of the chicken for? And then I make something else. Then the next day I make something else. Usually about four days for like a four and a half pound or four pound mini chicken. So I'm like, oh, how can I reimagine this? This is so exciting. And I wake up and and I'm like, oh, what am I going to make today? I'm like, this is so sad. Like this is literally... (laughs) the highlight of your day deciding uh, what you're going to cook for dinner. Oh yeah. The, but that's how you learn how to, that's how like a good strategy to learn how to cook is just like take one piece of main material and how many different ways can I make this good? Can I do that? Yeah. yeah. And so tonight we are going to do a, um, what is it called? What's wrong with me right now? Oh, cauliflower fried rice. Oh, nice. They're like, yeah. you know, Cauliflower mm. rice with whatever else in it. Vegetables. I have salmon in my freezer. I'm thinking of doing like a teriyaki salmon on top if yep. I want to get really wild. We'll salmon see. is a is a once a week, but my girlfriend cooks that. Uh, she's better at salmon than I am. But <laughs> she, my, Katie, my girlfriend, has been like my grandma used to wake me up when she babysat me, and she'd be like, "Get up, you got to go to school. What do you want for dinner tonight?" And I'm like, "Grandma." I can't even, I have to do breakfast first, you know, but that's what quarantine has done to Katie and my, like the night tonight, we'll probably figure out what do we want for dinner tomorrow night? Like it's crazy. Just so weird. Like it's so weird, especially for somebody that eats the same meal during the baseball season at Yankee stadium. I would say if I cover just regular season, uh, I won't do all 81, I'll generally do probably 74, 75 at home. I'll probably have the same meal 68 times. What is it? It is salmon with a Caesar salad with dressing on the side, add avocado. Okay. That's a good meal to have that many yep. times though. Yeah. Delightful. But yeah, like I eat the same thing. So to be cooking different things is kind of weird. I'm a very regimented kind of person a lot of times. And then on the road, it's like, where's the local Whole Foods? Okay. And then you get that and you take it to the ballpark, you do the whole thing. Um, but yeah, so. So I'm saying, so, so, uh, 
It's a regimented variety sport. of life. Yeah, it is. It is for everyone involved. Have you been following the updates on when baseball is going to come back and all the different plans that have been thrown out? I'm interested to hear like how they run through your brain as far as like sideline reporting goes. Like, you know, like the, the Cactus League versus Grapefruit League or the Arizona bubble, like from your perspective, your right. job, is it like, screw that or, oh, that would be fun? Um, for me, it's however you can do it, you know, the most safe. That, yeah. that would be number one, if I'm going to be in the ballpark. And we don't know what's going to happen with the announcers yet. Now, if you can't let a sideline reporter into the ballpark, I'm not really sure where that leaves me and my job. I'm hopeful <laughs> that I will be included and let into the ballpark. I think now more than ever, it would be great to have somebody that's there and able to tell stories to fans from being around. I don't see any way that I'm let into the clubhouse, but I could see me interviewing from six to seven feet away in a new kind of weird world. I would equate it to what you see in post-game scrums, or I'm sorry, post-season, you know, the post-game scrums where there's so many people and you have a lot of boom microphones. So I would think that I would have my own microphone and then there'd be somebody with a super long boom microphone that's picking up the sound from the player. That to me, if they allow it would make the most sense. But I think a lot of it is going to be mandated from major league baseball. So I don't think that I'm going to have a ton of control over that. It may shock you guys. <laughs> they haven't called me to ask my opinion yet. <laughs> as far as that is concerned, but I am hoping that if, and when it happens that I am let in for me, looking at it semi selfishly, I'm down in Florida. So not having to hop on a plane anywhere sounds great to me. Yeah. I can drive my own car, stay in my own place, go to the ballpark, come home. And that to me seems to be a safe scenario. A lot of guys have places down here, uh, whether it be for the Yankees or the Blue Jays or the Phillies, if they're in a reimagined league and everybody is down here. I think a lot of people have either second homes or they just live down here in the off season because it's easier to train. So I don't think it would be that terrible for people to get housing down here or get long-term housing if you say to them, hey, you're gonna be here for at least a month, you're gonna be here for two months, then we're gonna reevaluate, as opposed to doing a plan where you're still flying places, you're staying in hotels, you're taking buses. I think guys could, and not saying this would happen, but they'd have the ability to potentially just drive their own vehicle to the ballpark. It would be different. There may need to be something worked out as far as a gas stipend or tolls or whatever (laughs) it is. I don't know how that would work, but to me, the safest way would be to have people in their own place as often as possible with no flights involved. So if that means Arizona, Florida or everyone in Arizona. The only thing with everyone in one place, I don't necessarily know how that works from a, are there enough places to get all the games in? I don't think there are. No. So you'd need a place with multiple sites with indoor stadiums because who wants to do the afternoon game in Arizona in the summer, in Florida in the summer for that matter? Yeah, that'd be brilliant. And and the most recent plan, I, uh, I believe, unless it's changed but we've been trying to stay up to date is, is the, the 81 games at the home ballparks, but it would be mm-hmm. like the NL East and the AL East only play each other, which kind of would be a lot of train travel, I believe. But I think it'd be kind of cool to stay East coast. You get some games in Philly, I, but Canada's not open. So it's all where, you know, where right. are they yeah. going to play? Not open. You're still traveling to Miami. You're still traveling to Tampa. Mm-hmm. So you're still going on flights and you're still involving hotels. And that to me, seems a little dicey again no one asks me and whatever <laughs> they decide is what i'll be doing but i don't know you know it's it's really up to not only the league but the players to decide upon it as well if they're really concerned about their health and what's going on to really address the issues that i just presented you know and and see what's best for everybody involved um i think the early plans of them isolating not being around their families not being allowed to see anyone i think that might have been a bit of a stretch though maybe the safest still yeah. that's hard to have somebody to be away from their family for four and a half five months it just doesn't oh, yeah work. i'm having yeah. fun envisioning if you are allowed in and you can do reports that yes network just sends you to like an empty section uh of yankee stadium yeah. and they just do like a really dramatic <laughs> zoom in from far or like it's it's a close-up and then a zoom out and there's no one else around and you're just giving a, a nice little report do you, you have a lot of fun. 
I mean, we've got to be able to sponsor that in the way yes. where in the stadium is Meredith. And, and oh my God. Uh, you know, I just, yeah, upper, we just yeah. created a great segment. Wherever, wherever. Yeah. So that would be, uh, Polly would you know, cheat. Polly would look off monitor, you know, and just kind of be like yeah. browsing the stadium. That's a really fun well, we game. They should do that. We don't even know if they're going to be allowed in the stadium. The actual broadcasters. I know. The, I, if you know, they were. Play, play and, and whatever else. So um, will the home broadcast travel or will they do it from their studios? Nobody really knows the answer to any of these questions yet. So. If they if they were there, you know, like if Sterling's there and there's a Yankee home run, you'll hear the players will hear that call. Oh, yeah. That would be, be kind of so funny. Weird. It'd be so weird, but it would, it would so, also open it up to a lot of like, I don't know, just new weird funniness. Cause I think all the announcers will just be, you just hear them all yelling. Yelling at things. each other. Yeah. Gary yeah. Thorne in Baltimore screaming that Glaber has hit another home run. Right. Again yeah. and again and again. No. I, I just, I have an image of Meredith and DJ LeMayhew isolated in the seats and DJ just like staring at the field. I, I want to be out there and Meredith trying to get anything out of them. Um, and you know what? Honestly, I'd, I'd do anything to see that because that means we're, we're on a path for baseball. Um, do, you, do you let your mind like wander there? I mean, I, I, I don't want to put you on the, hot, on the hot seat or on the spot or anything like that. But do you, I know me and Jimmy, we, we fluctuate every day. You know, a good report leaks out and pass and says like, you know, this is too big to fail. And we're like, yeah, you know, they'll figure this out. Right. And then it comes out oh, non-starter. And we're like, well, we're never watching baseball again. We blew it. Couldn't be worse timing. How is that where you're at or what? I'm going to be cautiously optimistic just because I do believe there is so much money at stake on both sides. And I think they will find a way to figure it out. I hope that uh, each party is happy when that's over and if not happy at least content with what's going on and feels comfortable uh moving forward i just i can't see them not playing if it's possible from a safety standpoint to play i realize that is a possibility but i'm not really letting my mind go there in my mind i'm thinking there will be baseball at some point in time this season whether that's 82 games whether that's less than that whether it's a new crazy playoff format i don't know i'm just expecting to watch baseball because you know what <laughs> our livelihoods kind of depend on it as well. <laughs> we need content. So for me to sit and think about how brutal it would be if there'd be an entire season where no baseball is played, like why even, why even bother, you know? And it's very cliche. Like, don't, don't worry about the things you can't control. And nobody on this entire thing right now can control anything involving this. So hope for the best, try not to think about the worst and live your life, right? Live, the, live your yeah. life. Yeah. It's good advice. I mean, yeah, you got to be a little cautiously optimistic. Words but to live by. I go like crazy up and cautiously down. Optimistic. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, got to distance myself from the reports at some point, but we're trying to cover it as best we can. It's crazy, but you know, if there's baseball, everyone's gonna forget about everything. I think because it ties up so much of your time and your day. It's three hours every day. It's such an escape. Like, yeah. If they are able to offer that to the public, especially for you know baseball fans, uh, it's such an escape. To have that daily mental, like, who's the starting pitcher today? What's the lineup going to be today? Uh, who's available in the bullpen? And you just, you could think about it from, like, noon till game time. Baseball fans can just envision it every day. Uh, so I'm really hoping that we get that back. Fingers crossed. And, you know, if you're watching, yes, you can start with the Michael K show and mm -hmm. then go right into the BP show, go right into the pregame show, go right into the game, followed by the postgame show, and then we'll roll right into some more Yankees related programming throughout the night. So we really have you covered the majority of the day. And, you know, should you fall asleep, which you guys would never do something like that. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, you have the encore the next day. Uh, my Back friends, to uh, I Baseball. moved to California in high school. I told them like, Hey, I watched the pregame show, the game, and then the postgame show. And like, I can't hang out till that's over. And my friends were like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> you what every night? And I'm like, yeah, basically. I used to I used to TiVo the post game show too if like I had to go out go somewhere, just pretty addicted to baseball Yankees baseball. Now, did you want to be an announcer? Did you want to be a play by play guy? No, I mean no, I mean 
No, no, no. The, I would, I would do it as a joke. Like I played ice hockey, and when I was on the bench, I would talk into my stick like I was doing play by play and just annoy my teammates. And uh, no, they, they'd get really annoyed. Yeah, so like they shut the fuck up, Jimmy. So no, I never like <laughs> as a career wanted to actually do it. I didn't know what I wanted to do as a career until like two years ago. So. <laughs> We just invented a career. I'm glad it's all working out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we asked Twitter for some questions, and oh, I'll boy. start off Can't with. Wait to see what gems well, we've they, got They're here. pretty good. I'll start off with uh, an easy one. Brian Hoke says, "When will you babysit my kids?" He's going hard sell on this. See, I am the <laughs> person he knows that might be semi responsible. So. I'm first up, apparently. I have no problem babysitting the kids. I have zero children of my own. We've already discussed in a very bizarre fashion the fact that I'm an aunt to two nieces that aren't really my nieces. <laughs> but they're also not uh, imaginary. So what could possibly go wrong? I know they love princesses. I know they love Disney and cartoons and sing-alongs. I think, I, I think I'd hold it down. I think I'd yeah. be okay. So Brian Hoke, I will babysit the girls. It's huge. It's a binding contract. You just got to tell me when. Just hear a, hear a knock on the door right now. <laughs> like, here um, you go. Take them. <laughs> but here's the problem. I believe they are five and three, maybe. No, no, no. I think four two. and two. Four and two. Four and two. Four and two. So uh, I haven't been around them. I'd have to get a detailed report about where the Hoke family has been. Do I need to socially distance? And if I do, how am I going to do that with a four and two year old? It is impossible. I, I believe they're still at like an extended stay hotel in Florida. They never left I think either. They got a place. They're in Florida. I know where they are, but you know, have they been yeah. out and about? Have they been living cautiously, recklessly? I'd assume cautiously. Hoke is a rule follower. Yeah. 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 I'm, uh, I'm in the nicest way to our friend, Brian, I'm going to assume that his wife has, has had to leave uh, due to him screaming his John Sterling impression alone in the house while <laughs> doing his baseball simulation. Um, Mary, I'll, I'll let you twist this one around a little bit because I, I don't want, um, I, I don't know, people could spin it spin it the wrong way, but uh, Playoff Labor asked, what what is the most awkward experience you've had with an opposing player? Um, and I, I don't know if awkward's the right word, but maybe if there's something, uh, a good anecdote that you've had from an opposing player you talked to trying to think well the the biggest difference with opposing players is obviously they don't know me as well as the players i cover on a daily basis so they may have no idea you know who i work for what i do what my intentions are etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think trying to form a relationship with players from the opposing team takes even more time so i can't think of any incredibly awkward moment but i do remember uh what's his name Fernan fernando abad when he was playing yep. with the A's, I was in the camera well doing a hit. And even though he was about 10, 15 feet in front of me, the way the camera angle was, it looked like he was maybe a foot in front of me. And he's going like this and like waving his hands. And, <laughs> and Twitter was really annoyed at him. They're like, why don't you tell him to stop? Why would he do that to you? And I'm like, do what? The man is like 15 feet away from me. He has zero idea what's going on. Thank you for the support fans, but he's just going about his business. I'm going about mine. Uh, it's not the best optic. We apologize for that since it doesn't make for a great video. But Matt Stucco wound up reuniting us when I forget who he was playing for at the time, but he reunited us. And I asked him why he was at, why he was acting so messed up towards me. And I showed him the video. <laughs> And he's like, I didn't even know. People told me I didn't know. I'm like, I am, I'm kidding. So we, you know, we hugged it out, but there was never any animosity to begin with. Uh, but I did cover the minor leagues for a while and woof, whole new world. Not as polished with the media is all I'll say. Not as polished. Just guys being young or what? Guys being young, guys being guys. And you're just like, uh, uh, who raised you? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> You can't say that. That's not okay. Uh, but overall, I will say the vast majority of players have been nothing but uh, respectful for the most part available. I know everyone has their schedule. Some guys are more media friendly than others, but I've, I've been very lucky and very fortunate with the Yankees clubhouse. 
especially they you you guys know those guys i mean they really conduct themselves in a professional manner and for that i am appreciative because it's not like that everywhere yeah no and a lot of the, especially a lot of the young yankees uh that came up in 17 like you know and, and beyond like glaber and duhar i mean clearly judge was older when he came up but like just saying they see felt so polished in the yeah. their their attitude and their personality and and their, all of that and even stanton I mean, he gives you guys some sass sometimes, but I think he's really great and a really good interview as well. Uh, I enjoy the sass, though. It shows a little personality. I'm like, okay, that's what you want to say. That's what you want to say. And you mentioned Glaber. We actually caught up with him after the trade that offseason, and um, he was in Miami. He was working out in Miami. He was obviously the big prospect that came over. And this tells you something about him. He was just the sweetest kid ever. We went, watched him do his morning workout, just conditioning, agility, all that good stuff. And then he said, are you guys hungry? I'd love to take you to the place that I eat almost every morning. So we go there like, of course, yeah, we'll film it. Let's do that. Great. And he insisted on paying. And we were like, Glaber, no, 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 no. Like we're taking up your time. We'd happily get (laughs) you breakfast or whatever it is we're eating right now as a thank you for letting us tag along for the day. He's like, no, 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 you're my guest. I'm paying, don't think about paying. And we're like, like, what? Like, that is very sweet. That was very nice of him. He didn't have to do that. But it just kind of showed you that, you know, he wanted to do the right thing. He was being a gentleman. He certainly didn't have to do that. We should have 100% in that scenario paid for it. But he was being really sweet about it. Uh, And then later in the day, we interviewed him. And he had still been working on his English. So he had a translator. And at times, he would stop and just say, I got this one. And speak in English. So this was when he first got traded. This is when he first got traded. 19 years old. Yeah. So, and one of the craziest things that he told me during that interview is something that his agent told him early on, uh, when he had signed with the Cubs. And he said that you have to surround yourself with people that speak English and get yourself out of your comfort zone. Because when you become a huge star, you want to be able to interact with the fans. And the sooner you start doing that, the better. So Glaber at an extremely, extremely young age, to his credit, uh, wound up rooming with guys that spoke English. So he was forced to learn on a daily basis. And for a kid that, you know, isn't even in his 20s yet to have the wherewithal to see that that could be very important throughout the course of his year, his career, and take himself out of his comfort zone in a new country. I mean, that takes a lot of guts to do. And I give him a lot of credit for listening to that, where he could have kind of stuck with with people that he was more comfortable with. So kind of cool. And you wouldn't and now, fault him for doing that either. You no, know? you like, wouldn't, especially how young he was. And and he's still very young. But, you know, when he first was playing minor league baseball, I mean, I can't imagine leaving your family essentially for the first time. You do not really speak the language. You have no idea what you're in for. And then you're being asked to put yourself in an even more uncomfortable situation. Credit to that kid, man. Yeah. A lot of credit to that kid. I, I'm going the other way on that. That just means baseball is too easy for him. If you can worry about that, then you're, you're just not right in the head. You had to compete with Didi. Well, did you see him? Piano and video editing. Right. Yeah. Well, did you see him when he came up his rookie year and he stepped into the batter's box? It did look pretty easy. It still yeah. looks pretty and while the, there will be ups and downs, he slows it down in the batter's box. You could tell. I mean, he just has an idea every time of what he's going to do, and it, it doesn't seem like he is often phased by the situation. So, uh, obviously, a, the Yankees are high on him. A story I liked, <laughs> a moment I liked that was off the field from Glaber in his rookie year was, I believe you or, or someone asked him about the handshake with Didi and mm-hmm. who made it up, and they called it a dance. Uh, you know, what's the dance you do with? And he wanted to respond – um, it's a handshake. So instead of asking, instead of having the translator, he turned to Marlon and said, uh, come say DJ handshake or something like that. And Marlon was like, handshake. He just asked him, how do you say this word? And then he translated it himself. I was like, I've never seen someone use the translator. Like you learned that word on the spot and then use it as your answer. I was like, this kid is kids like made for stardom. Yeah, right. Uh, and one thing I say I'm going to do every off season is learn Spanish. I know a little bit, a limited, limited vocabulary, but so many people ask them to change, you know, 
change and adapt because they're playing in the States and in post-game interviews, they'd prefer that they didn't use a translator. And I understand that, you know, fans don't like the back and forth with a translator, but do people understand how hard that is when it's not your first language on the spot to think of what you're going to say, come up with an answer, not misspeak, not you know, not say anything that you don't want to say. I mean, that's incredibly difficult. And we asked a lot of these guys to do it. And I feel like the least I can do is try to reciprocate, return the favor a little bit and at least learn a little bit more to try to interact with some guys. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I'm not learning another language. I don't know. How, I can't do it. So I just so <laughs> much credit to them. Yeah, right. It's hard. It's really hard. And when every answer gets picked apart and quoted and like taken out of context and it's like you might not even set it correctly to start it's crazy but kudos to everyone that tries to do it or or does it at all it's funny have you ever uh tried to interview a guy trying to think because cano and melky did something once with i don't know if it was kim jones someone where like they acted like they didn't speak english and then eventually they're like cano was translating for melky (laughs) And then at the end, Melky just answered in English and the interviewer was like, wait, what? You speak English? Have you ever like uh, gotten, uh, like has anyone pulled that on you or like talked to a guy and then he responds in perfect English? Or just kind of pranked by the guys in general. Because I mean, there's got to be a little bit of, at least rookie hazing when you first came up. I'm trying to think. I don't remember any real pranks. I'm trying to think. I'm sure, I'm sure there's stuff that's happened over the years. But um, as far as... Uh, guys that would kind of mess with you a little bit and have some fun. Ichiro spoke perfect English, but he always used a translator. So sometimes he would start answering before the translator even started. So his translator, Alan, wouldn't even get the question out and he'd be like all in. Um, That's an easy job, huh? (laughs) Translate for a guy who knows English. How about it? And you can see since Tanaka has been with the Yankees, he's he's learned more and more and more every year. And now I think he pretty much understands, can speak it, but still uses a translator. And you can tell sometimes he'll he'll just start answering or he'll be like, all right, I know what you're talking about. But then he'll end the interview in English and he'll like mm-hmm. make a joke. And I'm like, oh, OK. All right. You knew what I was saying there. <laughs> um, but back to Ichiro, there was an inside joke going on going around inside the clubhouse and it involved some writers and it involved uh, some other personnel and Ichiro came up to me one day and said the inside joke, a portion of it in perfect English. And I looked at him and he was like, what? And I said, wait, what are you talking about? And he said, you know, you haven't heard. And then he said it again. And I was like, how did you hear about that? And he's like, everybody knows about that. And I wish I could tell you the story behind it because it's <laughs> hilarious. I'll tell you not in this forum, but I'll, I'll certainly tell you guys because it's it's absolutely absurd. But the inside joke then, Ichiro was waiting to have a good game where he was the guy on the field afterwards because he just wanted to say this phrase from the inside joke on the field to close out a post game interview. So don't you know, he has a game where he had a great game. They interviewed him on the field and I happened to be off that day. Aww, so the next time I was uh, there, he okay. Man, and he just shook his head at me and he was so mad. He's like, I can't believe you. Can't believe you in perfect English. I was waiting to do it and you weren't there. And I was like, I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Ichiro. The people listening to this are like, what's the inside joke? Guys, I can't tell. I can't tell you, it. it's a secret. It. Read it in the book. Read it in the book, right? Yeah. There you go. That's a good one. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, we won't take up too much more of your time. Thank you very much for for joining us. This was delightful conversation as always. Oh, it was wonderful. What a way to spend the evening. And you know what? On cue, I have 8% battery left in my MacBook. So I don't know how much time we would have had left anyway, guys. Perfect. Look at that. Perfect. Look at that. Well, thank you very much. We'll be tuning in. So you got uh, uh, Marcus... Tim's coming up. Anyone else lined up after that? Marcus Tim's tomorrow. Paxton. Paxton thereafter. And we might have a few others this weekend. Also, uh, some pretty cool stories with people that have been doing great things in New York City and surrounding areas for first responders, people on the front line, uh, medical staff. So we've been trying to find some of those stories, too. So we'll have a couple cool. of those coming up as yeah. well. Very cool. And one more thing. Uh, Thursday. 
don't know what time because I don't remember. But on the actual Yes Network, we are reliving the 2000 World Series between the Yankees and the Mets. It's a bit of a special that we hosted with the new technology. So you're going to hear from Paul O'Neill, David Cohn, Michael Kay, Jack Curry, Al Leiter about some of the pivotal moments in that series. I'm Should sure Al fun- was. Uh, I'm sure Al was thrilled to <laughs> <laughs> be tapped into that one. You know what, though? He's so insightful and he's so good and he's not shy about talking about it. It did not end the way he would have liked for it to end. But you look at his performance during that series and big games. I mean, big games. And he pitched well. I mean, he pitched well for the most part. I'm sure his arm was just dead at the end of that series. It was probably like hanging off. Yeah. But, you know, uh, He gave it his all. And I think Mets fans, though they didn't like the end result, in retrospect, when you look back at it a few years later, you have to respect his effort that he went out there with. Of course. All right. I'm tuning into that, too. We've been watching some old games, and it's it's just nuts. And I wonder if even some of our younger listeners even know. But, like, we watched the 163 game Al Leiter threw, and he threw 130-plus pitches. And, like, I don't even think there's some – young baseball fans that know that's a real thing. <laughs> that those thing. guys did that. Could you imagine how fast somebody would run out if somebody were on the mound and they were like at 120 or something? Like, I mean, it would never happen. You wouldn't even get to 120, I think, is a stretch. 110 is a stretch. Yeah. We, we watched, uh, we're watching a lot of game 163s and in 1995, Randy Johnson pitched it. And Jake did the math, and he averaged 120 pitches in his last 10 starts. 120 was his average. He had like 150 and some. He had a 160 on the board, yeah. Different times. (laughs) Game moves quick. Different Different times. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We will let you go, and we'll catch up. Thanks, man. Stay safe. Hopefully, we'll be talking baseball soon. Yeah. In life, unfortunately, all good things come to an end. And there you go. Dude, I, I, I didn't want to make too many jokes about Sterling with her on because they're clearly good friends. Uh, and Sterling's an awesome dude. I mean, the fact that he called her just a check-in is great. But I, yeah. I could have went on forever thinking about John Sterling announcing a video game from his, like... Like, if they just somehow sent it to his TV and made him announce it into his flip phone from, like, the bed of his apartment... And then broadcasted that. Like I, I'm just having a, a lot of fun imagining that. I mean, if Yes Network's willing to get there, I will personally make sure that BBD quarantine so we can send him to Sterling's house and set that up. Okay. Yeah, we'll offer that. We will. We are officially offering that, David. Also, dude, the. Uh... The, the, the where's Meredith game, like just put her in a section and then do it a close zoom in. And then yeah. Polly and, and Kay guess what section she's in left field, upper deck. I don't like it. Then like searching for that's a great game. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm team, you know, if, if this happens, let's say they are doing games at Yankee stadium and, and diff is the floating reporter or whatever. Get weird with it. Have, have her, you know, have her serving her own beer by the concession stand. Have her, um, have her be the only one in like the Hard Rock Cafe. Like, let's let's explore the space of Yankee Stadium. I'm in, I was I'm reading in. an article earlier today, um, and I guess the article isn't really based on truth because Meredith said she doesn't know what's happening. Um, but they're saying like announcers almost certainly won't be able to work at the stadium. They're gonna all be remote broadcasts. And Meredith would probably be the only on-screen person allowed in stadiums because she can do stuff from the stands, but she probably wouldn't be allowed in clubhouses, all that stuff. Um, Interesting. But I, but I guess that's not true or isn't like actually being talked about quite yet because I mean, Meredith didn't indicate that she knows. I mean, there's there's just so many different ways it can go. I mean, I. You know, again, if baseball comes back and what does it look like? I mean, the, you know, those are literally billion dollar questions right now. But um, I don't know. Like, I was almost picturing what if they set up a set up an iPad in the dugout and like <laughs> the hit guy hits a home run. You could come check in with Meredith and talk to her on the iPad like live. I don't know. Um, you Hopefully, if we do get baseball, maybe uh, maybe they can get creative with some fun stuff. 
Yeah, we'll see. Um, the, the FaceTime is kind of cool. I thought it was right? funny, like them being six feet apart with two separate boom mics, <laughs> like a really wide camera shot. <laughs> like that, dude. Oh, uh, when you said the zoom out of Meredith by herself in the stands, I mean, I had that same image just with DJ LeMahieu, and he's just like, <laughs> he's a dog just longing to be on the field. <laughs> Meredith's doing her best to get any answer out of him. Uh, yeah, so that's, again, that's where we're at. Well, go uh, tell Meredith that you enjoyed the conversation if you did and uh, go check out her shows. I mean, she got some good tidbits like Clark Schmidt was on. He said that him and his, when we had Clark Schmidt on our show, him and his brother were playing baseball together and watching reality shows. He went on with Meredith recently and he was like, yeah, I'm out of reality shows. Me and my brother are deep into Gilmore Girls. We are mm. binging. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, that's quarantine life right there, man. Yeah. That, is, that is that is brutal. But it's also, I've watched Gilmore Girls because I had a girlfriend that loved it. And my sisters loved it and all that. So they talked fast sure. on the show. All right. Thank you guys very Tweet much. Mayor. Hit, her, hit her up. Tweet at Diff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tweet at Diff. Uh, go Yanks. Tell them, Go Yankees.